Kia ora. Tēnā koutou i tēnā ahi ahi. My name is Melanie Thornton. I'm the Executive Director of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. And welcome to tonight. I think it's going to be a fascinating um, talk tonight. It's very good for us to be working with MFAT um, on this event. Um, they've very happily brought um, Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu to New Zealand, and she's been involved in a number of um, different events. Um, before I introduce her, though, I just need to run through a few health and safety issues. Um, as you know, we're the Shaky Isles. Um, in the event of an earthquake, um, the normal practice is to duck, cover and hold until the shaking stops, and then we'll exit and gather outside the old government building um, uh, near Bunny Street. If there is a fire um, in the same vein, we will um, follow outside um, through the exits and meet outside as well. So um, with that um, now uh, managed beautifully, um, tonight we're going to hear a speech from Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu um, on the Global Disarmament, Arms Control and Non-Proliferation Architecture, which understandably faces significant challenges. She's going to be talking about the trends in this environment and prospects for a new vision for disarmament for the 21st century. Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu assumed her position as Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs in May 2017. Prior to taking on this post, she served as Assistant Administrator of the Crisis Response Unit at the United Nations Development Programme, um, and she did that since nine, 2014. And that is where she got to know a very special guest in the audience tonight, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, and she'll be giving the vote of thanks at the end of the event. Ms Nagamitsu has many years of experience within and outside the United Nations system. She was also a member of the United Nations Reform Team under former Secretary General Kofi Annan and was previously Professor of International Relations at Hitotsubashi University in Tokyo. Following Ms Nak Nakamitsu's speech, we've got Tim Corhi, who's going to um, facilitate a dialogue with her um, before we open up um, the conversation to members of the audience. Tim is a senior fellow in the United Nations Institute of Disarmament Research, and he was previously Disarmament Ambassador and Permanent Representative of New Zealand to the UN in Geneva. So please welcome, along with me, Ms Nakamitsu. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Melanie, if I may. Um, Helen, I should address you more properly, but Helen is always Helen for me. Um, and of course, our good friend in the disarmament community, Tim, um, thank you so much. Um, I obviously should start with my sincere thanks to the New Zealand Institute for International Affairs for organizing this event. This kind of an opportunity is really important for me. Um, I think engagement uh, with younger people and also those who are interested in, in disarmament issues is exactly the kind of event that I should really focus, uh, precisely because um, the world is such a, a crazy place at the moment. Um, the uh, commitment to disarmament at the policymakers' level uh, in various countries really facing uh, enormous challenges, and that's exactly why um, we count on the public, younger people, and those who are, in fact, our uh, close friends and allies for, in the cause of disarmament. Um, in his remarks to the General Assembly um, earlier this year, uh, on his priorities for 2020, the Secretary General described the current high level of global geopolitical tensions, including devastating conflicts that continue to cause widespread misery, and the growing nuclear menace, he called, as the first of the four horsemen, um, representing four looming threats that endanger the 21st century progress and imperil 21st century possibilities. 
In his speech, he also highlighted the climate crisis, of course, and reality of deep and growing mistrust amongst people in institutions and political processes, all of which speak to current challenges that we are facing. And fourth postman, uh, mentioned by the Secretary General, speaks to future challenges. In fact, actually, it's already ongoing challenges, but what he called the dark side of the digital world. These include technological advances that are moving faster than our ability to respond or even comprehend. Definitely, I cannot comprehend. Advances such as the development of lethal autonomous weapon systems, which are machines enabled to target and kill without human control. All four of these threats are now contributing to the deterioration of global, national, and also human security. We are quickly stepping over the threshold uh, into a new area of geopolitical tensions and strategic competition. This era is increasingly marked by un unconstrained armed arms com uh, competition and um, interference also in domestic uh, political processes that we, we have seen uh, in the past, and the increasing pursuit of malicious and hostile acts uh, just below what we call the traditional threshold uh, for the use of force. Something is different uh, in terms of potentially causing conflicts uh, in the new world. Civil wars have also grown more complex, complicated, um, and protracted, and I would definitely say deadlier. We can see it in Syria, Yemen, Libya, etc. Fighting has moved from open battlefields into cities where thousands of millions of people are living. The consequences have entailed a massive loss of civilian lives and the destruction of civilian infrastructure. The international system is also becoming more multipolar. These challenges, um, in fact, are multilateral institutions responsible for building consensus and uh, pr producing agreements that will supposedly make our world um, a safer and more secure place. This paralysis, if you will, has worked to make some major military powers skeptical about the proven value of engagement, dialogue, and negotiations as the best pathway to achieve security. The implementation of certain internationally agreed obligations on disarmament and arms control are now decades overdue, and we can list a whole list of those things. The negotiations of other agreed priorities actually have never happened. Some developments in science and technology are quickly increasing the means of all types of actors to carry out armed attacks across international boundaries. Others are resulting in new means for states to pursue hostile and malicious acts. While many of those might fall under, as I said, traditional thresholds for the use of force, their nature and consequences can be profoundly destabilizing and increase the potential for actual armed responses. As a consequence of all these, the tendency has been for governments to rely more on military rather than diplomacy and negotiations, which only decreases security for all of us. Increasing militarization is evident in many parts of the world. Global military spending, for example, has more than doubled uh, in inflation-adjusted dollars since the end of the Cold War. International transfers of major weapons have steadily climbed since the early 2000s. These are the reasons why the Secretary General decided in 2018 to launch his agenda for disarmament. 
The purpose of the agenda is to restore disarmament back to the heart of the system of collective security set out in the United Nations Charter. Its objective is not to replace the responsibility of member states. It is rather to outline a set of practical measures across the entire range of disarmament issues with the aim to engage and partner with the entire UN system, generate fresh perspectives, and also explore areas where serious dialogue is indeed required. The agenda is comprehensive but not exhaustive. Its four pillars um, and its uh, uh, 40 four zero actions focus foremost on practical measures that can be undertaken by various UN entities in support of the efforts and initiatives of member states. We developed the agenda through a process of multi-stakeholder dialogue and consultations, including consultations with interested governments and, and civil society. Uh, I must have spoken to some 80, 90 uh, member states, the government representatives, and a whole range of uh, uh, civil society actors. And by the way, as you know, the UN usually works on the basis of mandates that are given by legislative parts of the United Nations. In this case of uh, um, Secretary General's agenda for disarmament, we have no such mandates by any of the legislative part. This was entirely his own initiative. So we took a risk in a way. Uh, usually when we do that, um, some member states ask, who asked you to do it? Um, but very uh, encouragingly, uh, we have so far received really overwhelming supportive words from um, many of the member states. Um, and, uh, and that really speaks to the realization in the international community that we need to indeed restore disarmament back on the agenda of the, um, the United Nations. So, um, allow me to just run through um, the elements of this Secretary General's agenda for disarmament. The first pillar of the agenda is disarmament to save humanity, and it addresses weapons of mass destruction. With respect to nuclear weapons, of course, in, respect, uh, in response to the deterioration of the security environment, our immediate focus uh, is on promoting renewed dialogue and supporting practical measures to reduce risks, especially in the lead up to the 2020 review conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Our aim is to ensure that this pillar of our collective security uh, retains its position as a linchpin, if you will, of the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. Practical steps to reduce the risk of nuclear war include steps to reduce all types of nuclear weapons, ensure their non-use, very important to, to make sure that the non-use principle is in fact uh, retained, reduce nuclear weapons role in security doctrines, security and military doctrines, reduce their operational readiness, constrain the development of advanced new types, increase transparency and build mutual trust and confidence. We must also continue to reinforce the norm against the use of uh, nuclear weapons, as I mentioned. As Reagan and Gorbachev rightly noted, a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore should never be fought. And from, from the point of these uh, normative uh, aspects, uh, strengthening um, norm against nuclear weapons through the uh, um, uh, adoption of the TPNW or the Treaty on the Pro uh, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons have added new energy into um, our efforts and we, we believe it's a, a really useful input into the toolbox, overall toolbox and instruments uh, for nuclear disarmament. In the longer term, our focus must be on facilitating those next steps that will take, take us further down the path to a world free of nuclear weapons. Now, with respect to other weapons of mass destruction, 
The use of chemical weapons in the Syrian Arab Republic has once again brought these horrific weapons onto the battlefield and threatened a taboo against their use. We thought it was confined to the pages of history, but it was not the case. We must therefore reinforce the regime against chemical weapons and ensure that they are never used again. Um, and from that perspective, uh, making sure that the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, I'm sorry, Chemical Weapons, uh, is uh, again uh, strongly supported uh, so that they will be able to carry out their mandated uh, responsibilities. We are also focused on strengthening institutions to prevent any use of biological weapons, God forbid, including by ensuring readiness to launch independent investigations to and to ensure that an adequate response can be mounted in case prevention fails. To this end, we have developed training and procedures and, and capacities in accordance with our existing mandates that were given by the General Assembly and, and also uh, endorsed by the Security Council. I must actually say that the current uh, COVID-19 outbreak um, is uh, uh, really interesting because it is actually shedding light um, and it, it is demonstrating how a disruptive uh, and, and deliberate use of disease as a weapon could be. Of course, COVID-19 is a natural uh, event, but can you imagine if this is deliberately used? Uh, we, need, we need really to um, uh, significantly improve our international capacities to respond to such events and also to make sure that all countries around the world have strong national health systems. So we are, in fact, working very closely with WHO uh, in this regard. On preventing um, the emergence of new and destabilizing strategic weapons, we have been working to prevent the extension of armed conflict into outer space, for example, through increasing transparency and mutual confidence building, as well as by uh, for, uh, forestalling any uh, weaponization. And there's a lot of intensive discussions taking place uh, for example, in the form of a group of governmental experts. As part of these efforts, um, we facilitated an engagement uh, from a commercial and civil space sectors um, in the intergovernmental process. This is an area we need to increase our exchanges with uh, uh, private sector entities, uh, which are now really uh, shooting a lot of satellites into to our orbit systems. We are also seeking to promote new thinking on how to address problems posed by lack of global controls on missiles, a huge gap in, in disarmament areas, which continue to be at the center of strategic tensions, jeopardize regional uh, keys and stability, and also, I need to add, put civilians at risk. And yet, as we all know, there is no global standard to, to this state. Um, as a first step, for example, a small, but I, I think it was a very important contribution, um, we, together with the uh, UNIDIR, United Nations Research Institute, um, in, in these issues, we published a study on the impl impl uh, implication posed by uh, something that is uh, a quite a, a serious concern to, to many of us today, so-called hypersonic missiles, hypersonic weapons. Now, I'm moving on to the second pillar of the disarmament agenda, um, which is entitled Agenda That Saves Lives, Disarmament That Saves Lives. And it addresses the objectives of mitigating the humanitarian impact of conventional arms, as well as excessive accumulation, insufficient regulation, and also illicit trade. Our efforts in, in the area of humanitarian disarmament focus on mitigating the increasing urbanization of armed conflict, as I mentioned already, which has resulted in devastating and well-documented impacts on civilians. 
In this connection, we are supporting a serious, a very serious effort to rein in the use of explosive weapons in populated areas through promoting common standards on the use of those uh, explosive weapons, the collection of also data and sharing um, of policy and practice designed to uh, protect civilians from the impacts of those um, um, in, 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 in armed conflict by the use of those weapons. I wish to acknowledge, of course, the important role that New Zealand has played and continue to play uh, in these efforts. As a supporter of this action, New Zealand's advocacy for a clear political commitment in making an impact at a critical juncture. It is also in line with the joint appeal uh, in September of last year issued by the UN Secretary General and also the, the, the President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, and, and by the way, this title of disarmament that saves lives um, actually came from uh, Antonio Guterres. Um, when we're discussing um, the key elements of disarmament efforts, he said very clearly, and I think um, his background as a High Commissioner for Refugees had a large part in it, uh, we need to make sure that disarmament can actually save lives, and we can actually save lives by focusing on many of those practical uh, areas uh, related to uh, conventional weapons. Beyond the um, actions in the agenda, uh, we are also stepping up our support for the efforts of states to mitigate humanitarian consequences resulting from irresponsible trade uh, in conventional arms. There is something uh, called Arms Trade Treaty, which is very important, established uh, the, uh, the first global regulation to prevent the diversion of arms to be used in violation of international humanitarian or human rights law, uh, or in the uh, commission of serious acts of gender-based violence. As uh, part of contribution to these efforts, we are now supporting states in their development of gender-responsive arms control as well. We are also working to improve, uh, improve inter-agency coordination to better help governments address the scourge of improvised explosive devices, IEDs. As a first step, we have now completed a mapping of the UN's internal capacity um, in, in the works related to this area. Our other major focus on conventional arms uh, is on integrating arms regulation into broader work of conflict prevention and also sustainable development. Towards this end, we are pushing uh, a, a new, more integrated, more holistic approach for supporting action at the country level uh, to end the illicit trade in firearms uh, and their ammunition as well. And I need to, I should have actually emphasized in the beginning, this is the agenda for disarmament for the entire UN system. It's not an agenda for my office. So as such, a whole range of different UN entities are in fact working in respective areas uh, of uh, disarmament efforts, uh, both at the headquarters policy level, but also at the country level actions as well. The third pillar of the agenda is disarmament for future generations. It addresses our need to remain vigilant in our understanding of new and emerging weapon technologies that could imperil uh, peace and stability, result in civilian harm, or strain existing legal frameworks. We are working to promote better understanding and awareness of the implications posed by developments in science and technology and their application to weapons. This will inc include facilitating efforts to encourage responsible innovation by industry, engineers, and scientists, as well as facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogue. We're seeking ways to promote the sharing of practice experiences and outcomes of new weapon reviews as mandated by uh, Geneva Conventions, um, which is uh, conducted by uh, states in accordance with their obligations under international humanitarian law. We're working to promote also a culture of accountability 
and adherence to norms, rules, and, and principles for responsible behavior in cyberspace. This has become quite a large part of our work. Uh, in response to growing autonomy, also in weaponry, we are actively supporting the development of new measures needed to ensure that humans always maintain control over use of force. New weapon concepts are being developed that may allow weapon systems controlled by algorithms to select targets and launch attacks without human control or human judgment. In the absence of common uh, standards and understandings on how international law applies in this area, we face uncertainty over how any such weapon could be used in conformity with humanitarian principles or the dictates of public conscience indeed. Our position has been very simple and very direct. The Secretary General has repeatedly stated um, on several occasions machines with the power and discretion to take lives without human involvement are, and I quote, politically unacceptable, uh, morally uh, repugnant, and should be prohibited by international law. And there are discussions taking place in Geneva uh, exactly how we, we might be able to achieve this. Now, moving on to the fourth pillar um, of the agenda, which is um, about strengthening partnership for disarmament. It rests on our belief that disarmament have been most successful when they involved uh, effective partnerships amongst all the relevant stakeholders, of course governments, but also expert community and civil society organizations, as well as strong interest and support from the general public as I started out this speech, and well-functioning international negotiation forms. So all these stakeholders have to come together in our view. Um, one of our leading objectives includes ensuring the full, equal, and meaningful participation of women uh, in decision-making processes. Towards this end, the UN's Disarmament Research Institute, UNIDIR, launched an online gender and disarmament hub to strengthen gender perspectives and published a very good report showing that women remain still underrepresented in multilateral settings and meetings on disarmament. Shining light on the um, continued disparities when it comes to inclusion of women in disarmament processes, in particular in leadership roles, uh, is the key um, part of our commitment um, and, and very close to my heart, uh, my personal priority, I should say. We are committed to working actively uh, for gender parity in all disarmament fora, and as the Secretary General reminds us always, gender parity means 50-50, not 30%, not 20%, 50-50. Um, so, um, we will be uh, work, uh, working very actively towards uh, systematic inclusion of gender perspectives also in substantive discussions and decisions on disarmament, arms control and, and non-proliferation very broadly. Um, this is another area where New Zealand, I should say, has played a very central role and in this regard uh, I wish to pay special tribute to long-standing leadership role, leading role, that Ambassador Delhigi has played in this field. She's very famous in the international community. Finally, young people, um, we say, are the ultimate force for change. We recently launched the hashtag Youth for Disarmament Initiative to engage and also empower young people. And we are creating a dedicated youth, uh, youth champions program, which uh, intends to create sustainable pathways for students to make meaningful contributions to the field of disarmament. Um, and I really look to younger people to occupy their place as uh, uh, ultimate force for change. 
more than a dozen half of um, uh, UN entities, as I mentioned, and others are working to support the implementation of this agenda because it is very comprehensive. Uh, we need a lot of uh, partner entities to, to work on this. A number of these entities are doing so in leadership capacity, uh, which I think speaks to the relevance of disarmament across many of the UN priorities, of course, humanitarian action, uh, which always played, in fact, a, a leading role in parts of disarmament discussions, but also human rights and increasingly sustainable development and peacekeeping, just to name a few. Through um, a dedicated website, we're dynamically uh, tracking the progress of 139 activities under the 40 actions uh, of the agenda, and those related to this uh, special sort of uh, references and linkages also made to sustainable development goals. Since we launched the implementation plan for the agenda in October of uh, 2018, uh, we have recorded progress in some three quarters of actions, and of course it will continue. The response from member states uh, has been largely positive, as I mentioned. A total of 23 states and one regional organization have stepped forward as champions or supporters of various actions across all pillars of the agenda. Uh, these champions and supporters, including, of course, New Zealand, have committed to, for example, financially support very generously or very strongly uh, politically uh, uh, supporting or leading um, activities in connection with those uh, various actions uh, under the agenda. Collectively, we can and we should be proud of the gains that have been achieved thus far. Um, they demonstrate that still considerable obstacles and challenges I refer to are not, in fact, insurmountable. Looking ahead, looking forward, the uh, Secretary General's Agenda for Disarmament recognizes that the notion of security has always evolved with a change in the state of the world. Over the past decades, the challenging nature of armed conflict and the uh, unspeakable human suffering um, it has caused has led us to uh, increasingly place human beings at the center of security. Yet, the objective, the methods, approaches, and the language of disarmament have not necessarily evolved in step uh, with our changing conception of security. This is why the Secretary General is calling for an articulation, if you will, of a new vision for disarmament in the 21st century. This new vision uh, should aim to reconceptualize our fundamental objectives in this field so that they speak clearly to our present need for the simultaneous achievements of human, national, and global security. So this has just been a brief overview of what we are doing to leverage all the tools in disarmament toolkit to improve international security environment. In our current times of heightened international tensions and conflict, many wrongly believe that security um, can be found only through the strength of arms or, or weapons um, and not through the wisdom of dialogue and negotiations and cooperation. This perspective is not only deeply dangerous, but I always say it is fundamentally ahistorical. In order to achieve real improvements in human, national, and global security, we need to retrain our leaders, uh, institutions, and societies in the language and the logic of disarmament. We need to remind ourselves that disarmament is a key element of security, it's an instrument for security, not a utopian or idealistic concept of the past, quite the contrary. We hope that the Secretary General's agenda for disarmament will serve as a leading wave in these efforts. Uh, we are not going to give up, quite the contrary, we will intensify our, our efforts 
um, in that regard. And I thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the exchanges. Um, first with, of course, Tim, and then uh, later on uh, with yourselves. Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to you all, and welcome especially to the High Representative Zuni Nakuitu. It's, uh, it's a delight to have you here and especially that you've travelled uh, at this rather troubled yes. time, both <laughs> globally uh, in these um, in security uh, <clears throat> dimension, but also in terms of the coronavirus. So um, I have taken from your introduction um, one or two things that I think uh, you have emphasised as being um, behind the Secretary General's uh, <clears throat> agenda for for disarmament, and I, I think the the emphasis you've made on uh, on the troubled world we we have um, of increasing tensions uh, and also of increasing military expenditure um, is a, an understandable incentive to, for us all to um, to take the Secretary General. General's agenda forward, and I will come back to that. Um, you've also emphasised the the changing uh, nature um, of conflict and its enormous uh, humanitarian cost. Um, a, a number of other elements you have uh, emphasised, but I, I think uh, if we um, can make this a, a, a really useful experience for you, it would be good um, to hear from um, the audience as to how New Zealand um, and, and other like-minded states might help you in, in delivering um, the Secretary General's um, uh, agenda. Uh, and I know you've made uh, one or two comments towards the, the end um, in that regard. Um, I thought uh, um, the concluding point you made about um, uh, disarmament as, a, uh, as a, an element of, as a central element of security is something that warrants particular consideration as we look towards the 50th anniversary of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, <clears throat> given that one of the standoffs uh, in the treaty is... Um, is whether nuclear weapons um, help underpin global security or whether, in fact, um, they uh, endanger it. Um, so with that, those elements um, floating around, I wonder, first of all, if I could start with the uh, Secretary General's agenda and um, just ask you perhaps to say a little bit more about the, the program for implementing it. I know it's two years uh, into um, its implementation and already uh, things have, have been happening. But uh, to also encompass what you think um, member states could do more to, to help mm -hmm. uh, that process. Well, thank you. Um, well, let me just say that, um, as I mentioned, we, the, we didn't have any legislative mandate, so yeah. we took a risk, but uh, the results or the reactions from member states have been largely positive, which is really encouraging for us, um, including um, the three of the P5s. Um, um, they have actually stepped forward as champions and supporters of actions uh, you know, that they, they think are important for their priorities. Um, so, so far, um, political support or the acceptance, acknowledgement uh, from the, the, the wider body of the United Nations membership have been quite positive. In fact, we, we've heard a lot of statements saying that this was very much timely. Um, you know, it's okay to, I mean, this is exactly what we expect from the UN Secretary General. It's interesting, this is the first Secretary General who have ever to have put together a comprehensive set of agenda uh, related to this armament. Mm -hmm. Now, um, agenda is really structured in such a way that we don't impose our programs or actions, but it's structured in such a way that it will be pushing 
um, member states to carry out their responsibilities. You know, it's interesting, in one of our early discussions with the Secretary General, I jokingly said to the, the Secretary General, you know, disarmament in a way is a little bit different from um, other parts of the UN agenda because we cannot disarm member states. They have to own this. They have to understand their responsibility and they have to take actions. Um, and you say, oh, why not? Um, so, you know, the whole sort of a structure of, of the agenda is to work with member states. It's not something that we can impose on the part of the member states. Um, we have so far, um, um, you know, started and then really making progress in the implementation of, I would say, about 70, 75% of the, you know, uh, 40 actions. And under the 40 actions, we come up with 139 very concrete activities. And, and those actions are going um, uh, quite well. Just to give, maybe to give a few examples so that people can really understand how this is um, helpful, I hope, to member states. Um, I mentioned, for example, the, the new weapons review. This is very important um, you know, in the context of laws, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems discussions that are taking place um, in um, uh, Geneva in the context of the CCW. Um, states parties of um, Geneva Convention, they are already supposed to be carrying out what they call national weapons review to make sure that any new technology, new weapon systems that they are developing uh, are in fact in line with humanitarian principles. Um, but it's strictly a national obligations. Um, and there have been very little or almost no um, exchange of, um, um, you know, experience and lessons how they might be doing these weapon, national weapons review. Uh, so we are trying to facilitate uh, uh, a platform where member st states parties, or actually it's high contracting parties, I beg your pardon, <laughs> they can come together and share their experiences on, on how they, you know, what kind of lessons uh, that they have acquired in, in the context of their national review of new, new weapon technologies. So these things will inform, we hope, their discussions on exactly how to um, make sure that um, laws, um, you know, will now go out of hand and then human beings can, in fact, retain uh, the decision-making uh, um, uh, power uh, in the use of force. Uh, so, you know, it's, we have really uh, tried to come up with very practical and pragmatic uh, areas of activities that will help member states uh, to, to come together and deepen their discussions, negotiations, and then coming up with potential options for solutions of, of, of many of those uh, um, uh, quite difficult issues. Um, again, also in the areas of um, um, uh, new technologies, um, you know, it's very clear that, for example, in the cyber area, we can't just have governments uh, coming together and, and discuss how to make sure cybersecurity issues um, will be uh, uh, discussed. So we need to bring in um, engineers, scientists, and industries uh, who can also inform governments what are the kinds of issues that are related to cybersecurity. Um, so we have brought together, for the first time in the UN uh, history, um, we managed to organize quite successful multi-stakeholder uh, uh, meeting where more than 100 private sector entities uh, came and had discussions with government representatives on those issues, um, which were found both by government representatives and the private sector people to be extremely useful. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, UN still has a quite important role to play, I would like to believe, in bringing different kinds of people so that we can have, um, hopefully, um, more creative, more innovative uh, um, uh, discussions uh, that can advance and, and break the stalemates um, in the traditional um, disarmament platforms. All this is, is, of course, partly because of the stalemate uh, of the yeah. conference and disarmament. Yeah. 20 plus years, um, they have not 
moved in, in, in the substantive discussions. Yeah, I was just actually going to, yes. to come to that because um, you, you emphasised that the Secretary General's agenda is, is for the whole of the, the United Nations, not simply for the disarmament arena and problems of coordination across the whole of the, uh, of the UN is one challenge and then the dysfunctional yes. disarmament machinery is another. Um, how do you see this as being taken forward in a, in a way that helps promote the agenda? In the member states' bodies um, or in the UN system? In the, in the UN system first yes. and, and perhaps also the member states' bodies. Yes. No, thank you for that question. I mean, of course, uh, a holistic and more integrated or comprehensive approaches within the UN system has always been um, a, a challenge. Yep. Um, I, I think it's really important uh, for all of us to be able to break the silos, but it's, of course, not that easy. I mean, when I, and by the way, I didn't ask to have this position as the, the high representative for disarmament. I was in the UNDP. And, and one day I was called by the Secretary General and, and he said to me, Izumi, what about disarmament? And I had no idea what he was talking about. I said to him, uh, excuse me, what about disarmament? He laughed and, and he said, no, 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 you doing disarmament. So I responded, what? <laughs> I never imagined. Um, but one of the things that he actually did say is, uh, I said that I have no experience in disarmament. He said, no, no, that's fine, you have experts in your office. Um, but what I want is someone who can look at disarmament from other perspectives mm. and shake things up. Um, so when I arrived, I immediately started to, to ask questions about the link between disarmament and sustainable development goals, of course. And it was not easy for my disarmament colleagues. Of course, the goal 16.4 is easy, straightforward, because it talks about illicit small arms, uh, etc. Uh, but how does that relate to other parts of SDGs was a huge challenge for my disarmament colleagues. So breaking the silos, always very um, difficult, because the terminology is different, approaches are very different. Uh, but I think it is a necessity um, because disarmament is not just about technical debates about different weapons categories. We need to place this disarmament at the center, at the heart of the UN's priority, and then make a very strong argument why it is important for conflict prevention, conflict resolution, but also the achievements of um, SDGs, uh, prevention of gender violence, all these things, of course, the climate issues are very much linked as well. Um, so only with that strategic sort of linkages made, um, and of course supported by the technical expertise of different uh, categories of disarmament issues, we can now start to again push uh, uh, disarmament discussions forward. So I think it's important to, to, to break the silos and, and that, would, that would be very useful in creating you know, new momentum and dynamism. I would like to have similar efforts also made by uh, member states. And, you know, of course, diplomatic communities always, you know, uh, separate also uh, uh, silos between those different communities. Uh, but one way of actually pushing this and breaking the silos is, um, uh, I think, achievable through bringing in younger people and also uh, women. Um, something interesting um, as a very uh, a concrete um, example, um, in the recent intergovernmental discussions on cybersecurity, um, you know, it's already politically very sensitive um, member states tends to speak from their very locked in, uh, you know, sort of ideological positions. But and this is not, I, I'm talking, um, this is the chair of the Open Edit Working Group, the, the Swiss ambassador uh, told me. Um, he said that new creative ideas are actually coming from younger female diplomats who are now entering into this area because they don't have the, the ideological uh, positions. They look at those issues um, as they need to be looked at. So bringing in new people, 
um, different generations, younger generations, uh, actually help um, to, to break down the silos and, and create a, a more sort of innovative approaches also entering into these debates. So I would like to see the same on nuclear issues um, and, and other areas, yeah, which is why partnership for disarmament, a lot of emphasis mm -hmm. on women and, and youth. And especially in the conference on disarmament, which, yes. as you mentioned, has been paralysed for 20 years and, uh, and negotiated nothing except its uh, annual report for the General Assembly. Uh, but it's, it's a situation that um, is extremely difficult yes. to, to remedy because it's, it's blocked for cynical reasons. The countries that have the nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. uh, not only the five in the NPT, but the other four as well, yep. are quite happy with the status quo and they don't want to move. And it's how we make them move that's the problem, as you know. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you want me to comment on the yeah, CD? Yes, please, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, CD is important. Yeah. It is the, it's not a UN body, it is the, um, um, you know, negotiation platform on multilateral disarmament. Um, and we all know the, the problems, uh, you know, decision-making uh, um, processes, but at the end of the day, it's not the, the rules of rules of procedure of the CG that is blocking. It's the no. political will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we need to somehow start with creating that political will. And um, actually, last, uh, last year, um, during the high-level uh, week of the General Assembly, um, one um, foreign minister from a European country, an important country, not a, a nuclear weapon state, but an important uh, country within NATO, um, came to, to see me, and then you know, obviously that country is quite worried about INF and, and all the sort of um, uh, new sort of tensions, especially uh, you know impacting on, on, on that part of the world, Europe. Um, and, and he asked me, you know, what, how can we in fact um, make both the United States and the Russian Federation realize that they have to go back to um, dialogue and, 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 and um, um, negotiations. My response was quite similar to what he was thinking, which is that, um, you know, when, when they come to a realization that um, it will soon, you know, start to negatively impact their national security, um, that is the time when we need to prepare a good platform and also good options for ideas how they might be able to start moving again on, on um, disarmament issues. In other words, as I mentioned in the, uh, at the end, um, disarmament is not about creating an idealistic world. It's, it's a security yeah. instrument. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I also point out a historical fact that during the, the Cold War, that was the last Cold War, um, the leaders of these two super, nuclear superpowers actually uh, did know that. Uh, they, they realized that, um, you know, um, going at each other too much will harm their own security. It's actually remarkable that only a year after the Cuba Missile Crisis in 1963, there is a, a partial test ban treaty. Okay. Only a year after that uh, near nuclear uh, incident, um, but also INF Treaty was negotiated at the height of the uh, uh, Cold War. So it's, it's a myth that mm. disarmament yeah, uh, harms national security. Yeah. So we need to, to make a, a very consistent uh, um, uh, argument vis-à-vis um, -vis those uh, nuclear weapon states and other nuclear uh, uh, armed states. Uh, Kashmir... Uh, was really a worrying uh, um, incident. I mean, if there is any nuclear incident or accident, um, it's probably, um, it would probably happen in the context of a regional tension. So we need to make sure that those issues are looked at uh, from that point of view uh, and make a very strong security argument. And only with that kind of an argument, I think there will be a movement uh, towards or movement back towards uh, um, direct engagements. Um, and then, of course, we need to review disarmament um, um, uh, 
um, mechanisms um, that we have at the moment that is also part of the, yeah. the partnership section. As you know. Um, if, if before we open the floor for uh, for questions, if I could ask one more question of rather more parochial bent, um, and it's about missiles. Um, as you know, New Zealand's chairing the, um, yes. the Missile Control Technology Regime, yeah. uh, and uh, through Delhegi. Um, and uh, you mentioned this morning in the event in, in Parliament buildings uh, towards the end um, that uh, missiles in, in several respects. And of course, one of the aspects of missiles that's particularly worrying is that at, at a certain point, at one point, missiles were either carrying nuclear weapons or c conventional weapons, so that um, the incoming weapon was more or less able to be read. Nowadays, it's possible to have conventional and nuclear yes. missiles, uh, weapons on the same um, missile. Um, this is a, a pretty worrying development, yes. and I just wondered whether how, how missiles fits in your overall thinking about perhaps a move towards a confidence-building measure, of getting um, exactly yeah. sitting down and talking yeah. about these issues. Yeah. I actually think missiles probably the most difficult one to tackle. Yeah, it is difficult. Um, it's been a huge gap in in all of disarmament discussions. Yeah. Uh, and that's precise. I mean, even JCPOA. They left out the missiles because they knew that they might be able to agree on the nuclear programs, but they would never be able to agree on the missiles part. So it was left out from, from that. Um, we don't have any global standards. Um, and, um, and so I think missiles probably, and then the, the sort of definition um, is even already uh, contentious. I mean, in the context of a Security Council discussions on, on DPRK, in recent months, they are always, um, you know, debating whether what they shoot up is a, um, a artillery rocket, artillery yeah. or ballistic missiles. Um, so, on you know, several different aspects, missiles probably one of the most difficult issues. Um, in recent months, um, several countries actually have. Uh, stepped forward and, and, you know, in acknowledgement of this uh, challenge or the, the, the fact that missile is the, the biggest gap in disarmament discussions, they want to start having some sort of a dialogue process. The Germans have started to, to have um, missile dialogues. Mm -hmm. I was actually supposed to go to the second meeting, uh, which was supposed to take place in Singapore, but of course, mm -hmm. with the corona, it's now postponed until uh, September. Um, the fact that uh, um, governments, states, uh, starting to say that this is a gap, we need to somehow uh, start, um, you know, some sort of a standard. Uh, as you say, I think the first step, always, um, you know, transparency and confidence building will help, um, and um, and addressing, um, you know, some of the new areas like hypersonics, which yeah. is. Uh, yeah. I mean, we don't know exactly if it is uh, true or not, but um, a, a few countries already say that they have deployed hypersonic missiles. Mm -hmm. um, so there are um, definitely um, a, a strong need for international community to start tackling this. Um, and, and we have started to message this as one of the critical priorities That's good. going forward.